Every year, Malcolm asks me to uh, be a guest lecturer of one of his classes there, and I always talk about soil and water districts, and I just gave him a card with my new number on it, and he reads soil and water, and he says, what is a soil and water district? So obviously, I guess we still haven't gotten our message out, but uh, I always talk to the kids at the Envirothon, telling them that back in the 1930s, if you hit your computer and just type in Dust Bowl and look at images, it will show you the damage that was done to this country back in the late 30s and early 40s, especially if you look at Black Sunday and what happened when a dust storm back in the Midwest traveled across the country and snow fell in New York City that was red from all the dust that was in the particles on there, and the federal government finally realized they had a significant problem and somehow managed to get all the states at that time, the 48 states, to pass legislation to create soil and water districts and later on the two additional states and the four territories did. And we have virtually every county in the state. New York passed their uh, law back in 1940 and the first soil and water district was created in 1941 and I think in 52 the county created our local district. And we work uh, to do a lot of things to protect uh, the soil and water resources of the county. And I wear two hats, the county district and also the state soil and water committee administers to the 58 districts. Uh, I want to thank first uh, Senator Laval for uh, providing us with money last year, a million dollars. We have lots of money that just passes through our hands. If we could just take 10% of what passes through our hands, we wouldn't ask you for any money. But. Uh, he gave us, uh, well, gave the farmers that he sent a million dollars for deer fencing, uh, and we administered the program, and I don't have all the figures, and later on when we take pictures out there at some of these sites there uh, with the senator, I'll show you uh, what was actually done with that money to provide some protection to the farms from the damage that's been done over the years and still is being done to, from deers. I want to thank Peter for a uh, memo you we have, uh, the only one of its kind in the state, uh, Memorandum of Understanding with the DEC for the pesticide fines program they collect from people that are improperly using pesticides and instead of just throwing it into some fund where it gets lost, we use it to help farmers build pesticide mixing pads so that when they're mixing concentrated pesticides and it spills, it doesn't go back into the groundwater, instead it gets recycled. And uh, this past year, you passed several pieces of legislation that's helped us, and the most significant was allowing soil and water districts to hold conservation easements, and that's why Ed was laughing, because when you said you're looking for someone to hold it, well, this law just passed, and he said, well, contact the county uh, real estate department, because now soil and water districts can hold conservation easements. So it's another opportunity for us to get involved in helping manage land, especially with farmers, because we're already working on agriculture, environmental management, we're out there with them every day in the trenches, helping them to work on plans to help them be better stewards. So I gave you a sheet that talks about what we're asking for, and on the second page of that sheet is the state law that uh, you created that uh, gives counties the ability to create districts, says that soil and water districts can get reimbursed up to 50% of their expenditures, but then it says not to exceed $30,000. That hasn't changed in about 30 years. So we submit budget amounts. It may amounts be another 30 years before <laughs> but the we're way we're going. We're not asking you to put the money in there, but we're asking you to lift the cap so when you have the money, we can go beyond that amount. And actually this year in the governor's budget, he did increase it. And I learned something new, even all my years in Albany, along with you fellows. I thought you had to actually change the law, but he put in, uh, instead of 30, he put 38,000. And if you approved his budget, well, there'll be an allowed an increase this year, so we'll have 8,000 more for each district in the state, so that's great news. But you'd have to then approve it again next year. So what we're looking for is a permanent lifting of that cap, so whenever you do have money, at least we won't have to change the law. It will allow us for an increase on that year based on the availability of funds. Uh, being consistent with my theme over the years, I'm certainly going to speak to water quality, and, and thank you for pointing out, I guess, uh, an issue I've been trying to resonate for several years now, and that's obviously the impact from wastewater. Um, the evidence is clear. I mean, we've, we've seen a significant trend in the last six, eight years of impaired water bodies, you, you know, entirety of uh, Suffolk County, South Shore, numerous ponds, freshwater systems, and it's all uh, nitrogen loadings. And ultimately, uh, all roads lead to wastewater. And that's, you know, been conclusive, certainly from a, a recent study on Great South Bay, and then more recently, um, Suffolk County's own water resources management plan. So this, these are alarming, and I recognize the complexities of this issue, um, how daunting it is, but we, we've got to get to work here. Um, as a, a recommendation for specificity, um, you heard we're largely um, on-site systems, you know, 75 plus percent throughout Suffolk County. 
I know there's been a lot of discussion about sewering. Um, you know, there's positive effects to that, but at the end of the day, I think um, Suffolk County is largely going to be unsewered and continue that way. So we've got to deal with, in, in a way, the, the current infrastructure. Um, to the county's credit, they have actually just approved two innovative systems that are effectively effective at denitrification and can actually uh, treat wastewater down to sewage treatment plant levels. Uh, that's you know certainly a, a, a disparate from the conventional systems that are in use. So as a specific recommendation, and I would ask that you maybe try to bring this forward through a state level, I think uh, both on uh, Suffolk County Health Department level and, and even the towns, because they do have local authority to have more stringent wastewater regs, is to lower the bar, or raise the bar rather, and enact uh, a more stringent uh, total nitrogen discharge standard of five milligrams per liter, five parts per million or less, because we know the technologies exist. Uh, they've been approved by Suffolk County. Uh, we should not be continuing with the status quo by uh, approving conventional systems day in, day out, uh, and just perpetuate where we are. So uh, under the really federal law, the Clean Water Act uh, administers or, or delegates authority to DEC, which in turn delegates authority to the health department. They have the ability to uh, require these more stringent uh, discharge standards. So going forward, all new development uh, requires uh, uh, higher performance, and then we figure out how we start to phase in uh, with the existing infrastructure. But again, I, I think this is a really urgent matter that uh, largely we just haven't been dealing with. I don't uh, you know, dismiss the cost implications to both individuals uh, as well as government at, at large. But uh, you know, nevertheless, we've got to deal with it because um, you know, the driving forces of our economy are these water bodies, our estuaries. And um, you know, at, at some point, we're going to get to a crisis stage, which, uh, quite frankly, Cape Cod's dealing with now. Uh, the second item, and um, also a water quality issue, is, is the stormwater permits, the uh, referred to as MS-4 permits. Uh, again, under the Clean Water Act, the uh, DEC was uh, acting as the agent to administer these general permits to the municipalities, so the counties, uh, the towns, the villages, et cetera. Everybody's uh, required. Um, New York State Waterkeepers, in partnership with NRDC, about two years ago, uh, we challenged that general permit uh, issued by DEC. Um, approximately three or four weeks ago, uh, a state court, state supreme court, ruled in our favor and really more or less nullified the permit or ordered DEC to go back and to strengthen the permit in three particular areas. Um, there has to be specificity to these permits relative to the uh, regions or uh, areas that we're dealing with. In other words, uh, Brookhaven Town may very well be different than East Hampton. Um, ultimately, again, this will have a more meaningful effect for local, the local landscape, if you will. Uh, second, secondly, there has to be performance standards or timelines, rather, uh, where these milestones are actually being met. And I will say I have uh, bird dogged uh, many of the public meetings, you know, as, as educational meetings uh, before the towns. And the implication, as I read it, was this is a voluntary program. You do the best you can. No, it's mandated by law. We have to do it. And again, there's cost implications, but uh, we've got to move forward because stormwater, uh, like wastewater and groundwater, uh, is a serious threat. We clearly can't keep doing what we've been doing. The studies have shown nitrogen's increase, increasing in both the groundwater, in our surface waters. We've got to do something different. And quite frankly, there needs to be more responsibility taken on the part of our governments to ensure that what we are doing is actually protecting the groundwater. So to your point, Kevin, um, we do need those standards and we need to make sure that when we're okaying um, uh, how we're dealing with wastewater, that um, we are, uh, we're approving what is the latest technology and the greatest and the um, whatever, you know, five years, every five years, we should re be reviewing the standard that we're setting and making it a higher standard or a lower standard, depending on how you look at it, lower parts per million or higher greater standard for water quality. 
And we can't keep allowing antiquated cesspool systems that are technology, if it's even technology, but the <laughs> 60, 70 years old, and we're going to keep letting that be what we're okaying to protect our groundwater. I don't think that's right, and I agree. We have to work on we have to work on how we can encourage, um, and we'll probably just have to start with new construction, you're right, and we're gonna have to um, encourage, uh, um, you know, what exists to turn over to something new, and we're gonna have to find ways to help facilitate that, and we'll start with areas and zones that are most important, and um, we'll find ways to incentivize that, because it is a great cost to residential um, individuals. Um, land acquisition. We live on an island. People come here to visit because of the vistas, because of our water, our clean water, our beautiful beaches, our farms as you drive out. Um, you know, looking at the vineyards, and we all know this, and we all are in, in agreement here. And Suffolk County has, has, has a tremendous land acquisition program that has protected thousands of acres um, over the decades. And we're at a crossroads right now with this land acquisition program. We borrowed against future revenues, and we brought the money forward, and we bought the land now to protect it from development later. And we're at the the point where that money is running out, uh, that money, the accelerated program has ended and now we're at pay go. And so we have to, some, a lot of the money that's coming in, um, we paying off debt service. And so the money that's coming in at, that we have to spend on land acquisition is down. Not because it's being spent on anything else, but because we decided to spend to take it, bring it forward, and spend it um, ahead of time so we could protect the land. And so we have to make sure that if we only have four or five million dollars a year, what we're buying is the most precious environmentally sensitive pieces and, and the most important farm farms. And so we have to really prioritize. And that's kind of the discussion that's going on in the legislature now. And we're clearly at a crossroads with that program. And if we want to reach all of our goals with land acquisition, we probably do need more money. State University at Stony Brook here, Suffolk Community, Farmingdale. Uh, we have great intellectual resources. Uh, for instance, Malcolm and Larry Swanson kind of uh, advise, are advising me with um, scientific um, knowledge on an important issue in our state that uh, called fracking. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I was glad to see that Newsday said Long Island really does have a stake in the fracking uh, issue. Some of my colleagues wanted to know why was I so interested in the issue of fracking since it didn't, they weren't going to be doing any fracking here in Suffolk County. Um, so I just want to say there are intellectual resources that, you know, we can tap into regardless of your issue and really get um, some of these issues, Adrian, you're talking about some heady things, and um, we, we can get uh, scientists who have, um, are nationally, internationally renowned on some of these subjects who can give us advice. Just to add to what the Senator just said, we are uh, looking at adding uh, a new program at Stony Brook in the area of civil and environmental engineering and we actually have started recruiting students. The, the students, this program will be starting this fall. So we will have professors, we will have students that can work with you in the environmental engineering area and uh, coming up with new technologies. Um, I want to thank the senator uh, for the designation of the Center of Excellence. It's the Center of Excellence for our Energy Center. That, I think, is very, very important for Long Island. It will help us. Uh, um, develop new technologies, and we are working on some very interesting technologies that are 
uh, related to um, uh, the whole area of renewables, uh, storage, etc. We have uh, we have some outstanding programs. They're working jointly with Brookhaven National Labs. We work very very closely with Brookhaven National Labs. The partnership in in the energy sector uh, is really extreme. We have extremely good resources on Long Island, and I think for the governor and uh, to recognize that, and by designating as a center of excellence, there are only seven centers of excellence in the state, and now we have two of them on Long Island. So that's, that's a great accomplishment. So um, I want to thank the senator for all the work that you've done, uh, and uh, just keep doing it. Thank you. We've spoken before on the issue, and I'm glad you brought it up. It's hydrofracking. Uh, for people not aware of it, it's a method of getting natural gas out of what, for all intents and purposes, is rather hard rock. Can you tell us your name? I'm sorry, it's Jane Fasula with the Sierra Club. I'm also with the uh, New York State Executive Committee of the Sierra Club and on the Gas Task Force. Um, it is very clean where it's burned. It's not quite so clean where it's gotten. It poses many problems for people living in the areas where the gas is being extracted. And for many Long Islanders, such as myself, we have vacation properties and places we wish to go, such as the wine districts upstate New York, and possibly even many of the campsites. Those quiet retreats are going to soon be gone if gas fracking actually does take place. Um, the process requires ongoing noise, pollution of water, because they use it to poison it literally to dissolve rock. And if you want to get involved with something that can dissolve rock, all the credit to you, but I would rather not. Um, in addition to our losing our possible quiet vacation places, we have another issue. Should there be poisoning of the water that now supplies New York City? We are looking at New York City coming to Long Island to get its water. Keep in mind it did get water from Nassau County prior to the time that they put in the aqueduct systems. And so it's not unlikely that New York City, which has already tried to store water in the Lloyd Aquifer, is going to come here and say, hello, we could use some of your drinking water. And I think that speaks to the issue of poisoning our own drinking water. It's almost going to work against us if we keep it clean because it's like saying to New York, hey, here's a good source of water. It's a, it's a two-way street on that one. But be it as it may, I don't think we want our water poisoned, and I don't think we want New York coming here. And the third thing about um, the drinking water issue for fracking, although it's not exactly likely to happen, of the list of places that can process that poisonous water, six of them are here on Long Island. And the reason I say it's not likely they'll be using our six plants is because it's a long distance for them to truck that water down. However, it could happen, and certainly all plants are not equipped to remove that. Coastal erosion. Um, it is something that, especially last year, given the nor'easters we were hit with, um, has become an increasing problem. We all know we are the victim of decades, if not centuries, of, hap of haphazard planning on Long Island. At one time, somebody thought it was a good idea to install, you know, a groin or gabions or something many years ago or, you know, bury um, sewer rings along the coast because they thought it would help uh, with coastal erosion. And now we have the problem uh, that is disturbed liturgical drift. Um, we need a comprehensive study of uh, how we are going to deal with the issue of coastal erosion. Um, I want to really thank um, uh, Director Scully, uh, he did a wonderful job um, after those storms, uh, especially in the area out in the South Hold of Hashimama Cove, um, properties that were severely impacted. Um, we need to protect both private and public resources. Um, we are literally within feet of a breach of a public roadway uh, right now on the North Road out in the area of Hashimama Cove and South Hold. Um, we have a problem in that we cannot um, amortize out uh, our investment with the federal government. Uh, we need a million and a half dollars to invest with the federal government, with the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, and they will match those funds to do a comprehensive study of um, coastal erosion. Uh, it's first, it has to be first instance funding for us, and we need to put that money in its entirety forward. Uh, we are working to do that. Um, the other issue that pertains uh, to the DC, and it's something that I brought up a lot, and I think uh, Mr. McAllister will be happy that I was actually paying attention to him when I was chair of the Environment Planning and Agriculture Commission. Um, we had a lot of discussion on the Seagrass Protection Act, um, and uh, we passed that in the assembly. Uh, and when I brought up the issue of eutrophication, which is the nitrogen loading in the water. Um, we talked about the issue of septic systems being the bulk of the problem. And unfortunately, that bill put almost all of the burden 
uh, in finding solutions to this onto the DEC. And my argument was the DEC did not have adequate resources and that we need to give the DEC the resources they need if we are going to charge them with finding solutions to a problem of that scale. Um, during a time that these resources are limited, I think it brings to the point that, that Adrian and, and others here have made and the Senator alluded to is we have a great collection um, of talent in this room. Uh, we have resources that we can work together, um, that this all doesn't have to fall on the shoulders of one agency and collaborate amongst multiple levels of government to achieve um, some of the directives put forward in that legislation and in other initiatives um, to be able to find solutions to these problems. Um, sometimes, despite being well-intentioned, we don't provide the resources to actually be able to accomplish the tasks that we charge certain agencies with. And that's where I think that um, these type of collaborations uh, can really work well amongst multiple levels of government. I just want to uh, say in that regard, um, there's a new day in Albany, um, and you've heard this cooperation, collaboration. Um, governor talks to the Senate, Senator Skelos, talks to the Assembly through Speaker Silver, the members, and uh, a lot of stuff is getting done, a lot of stuff. We have a problem. Just about every one of our regulatory programs as it affects groundwater and surface water doesn't work really well. And therefore, the acknowledgement and the, the main point that most of us are trying to convey when it's all said differently is, so we need to do better. And what does that mean? We need to do better on a number of scores. And that doesn't mean it's easy, and it's not going to, in some cases, it may not even be cheap, but the alternative is worse. We have bays and harbors on Long Island that have two types of red tide. One, if you get, if you eat fish from one type of uh, a red tide, you're spending an extraordinary amount of time in an extremely violent way in the bathroom. And, and then the other one is where you can actually be paralyzed for a period of time both unpleasant, especially together. And um, so, so that's the cost of having too much nitrogen in our bays and harbors. With brown tide, it's, it's, uh, Chris Gobler's recent work has established that he believes brown tide is linked to too much nitrogen in, uh, in, our, in our waters. And so we've had three really unpleasant brown, uh, uh, harmful algal blooms tied to too much nitrogen. So until we make the decision that this has to, we have to do better, that's the cost of leaving everything the same. Why do, so what does that have to do with the EPF? The EPF is the only, as most of you know, the EPF is the state's only environmental investment device. It is the expression of the priority in New York State that this is how much the environment means to us. Everybody knows it's a hard time right now. The extent to which conditions can be set in place this year to create, to create preconditions for the situation to improve next year is, is terrific. So there's one bill that, that may be a, 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 a way to help that along. So Grisanti, Senator Grisanti has a bill, I think Latimer in the Assembly has the uh, other one, where the money from the recently adopted bottle bill a few years ago would be over four years put into the Environmental Protection Fund uh, which is frankly, you know, for those of you that are, have a hair color like this or have been around long enough, that's always what the bottle bill extension was supposed to do. So, you know, to the extent that those of you in the state legislature can help that bill along, that would be terrific. Uh, getting the EPF up to a better number than it is now is essential. Um, building the case for that to happen going forward is equally essential, and the costs are real unless we're addressing some of them. The other a couple of other points I think are, are, um, are helpful is uh, the extent to which we're doing those things that leverages the federal money we get from the Peconic Estuary Program and the Long Island Sound. And it's easy to collaborate when everybody's got a stake in the game with, with real money as opposed to just the best wishes of everybody's best efforts. Um, and the last point I'd like to make is, is uh, on the issue of fracking. Um, I too didn't think there'd be much of an issue on Long Island. but most fracking fluid is not the same thing that most of our sewage treatment plants on Long Island or New York City are used to, or for that matter, designed to take. 
uh, something to really think about, whether, whether we need one more injection of un unpleasant and, and so-called trademarked uh, uh, pollutant that no one knows the effect of on our bays and harbors would be a real bad idea, I think. Two years ago, you announced the end of Broadwater. You were happy about that, and I said to you, not so fast. There's a move to put three Broadwater-type facilities in the New York Bight, and so you put it back on your list. Then last year, I was uh, able to tell you that thanks to a veto by Governor Christie in New Jersey, all the Broadwater-type facilities were now dead. Well, it turns out that Liberty Gas from New Jersey is trying to uh, get around Christie's veto by moving back into New York. We need to protect the New York bite. We need to see to it that the only energy generation is going to be clean, renewable energy, not carbon-based fuels. Uh, we need to protect the 300 species of fish that are in the bite. We need to protect the Montauk fishermen. We have the largest commercial fishing fleet in the state of New York. They depend upon the, the health of this resource. If the state of New York can support a clean ocean zone and see to it that the only energy generation coming out of the bite is clean and renewable, we'll go a long way towards helping the fish and the fishermen.